Hi, I'm Dennis Marin with Industrial Light and Magic, and I was one of the effects supervisors on Willow that we did about 25 years ago. And it was a pretty exciting time since it was early computer graphics. And one of the sequences I'm most proud of is the morphing sequence. We're going to now take a look at a documentary that was made in 2001 that shows what it was like doing something for the very first time. I hope you enjoy it. For me, one of the milestones was to do the morphing in Willow. I'm Willow Upgood. Willow. 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 Peck, 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 peck. Transform. We needed to transform characters one into another, so we created the technique of morphing. When the movie came out, it got an awful lot of talk about the morphing being something pretty, pretty striking. They've said digital filmmaking is just going to revolutionize everything. It was really fun and exciting to be part of a, of a breakthrough. Willow was a huge project. When I read that script, it was just, you know, loaded with all sorts of stuff. It had, you know, giant things and the tiny little brownie characters and all sorts of stuff of every different type of effect you could imagine, the magical stuff going on. It was just a huge undertaking. In order to make fantasy work, you have to create a, a kind of immaculate reality that exists for the moment of the movie. And without that, the fantasy won't work. If you're easily shocked, please turn away. That's obviously a very integral part of creating these, these kinds of movies, the fantasy movies. I think Willow is interesting in the, in the history of effects in films or whatever, that it was sort of approaching the end of the traditional photochemical way of doing effects, but was ready and actually in the area of morphing leapt into the computer graphic world. It was sort of jockeying the two positions, you know, and it was pretty neat. We were, had been dabbling with computer graphics work here, and we had done the stained glass sequence from Young Sherlock. It was, seemed so easy to, to do that work, although it was incredibly hard. The promise was really like, hey, this is going to be great when it finally happens. When Dennis evaluates a project, he looks at it from the point of view of the filmmaker, of the director, and solves the problem first from a storytelling aspect and enhanced by the aesthetic, and only finally, how is it going to be done? There are some examples in Willow of previous technology uh, being applied to the same sort of problem. That's done with, with building small models and through cables and bladders and wires, being able to, to make a model pull apart or stretch or contort into another shape, then you cut away to somebody watching that. And then you cut back again, and you've got a whole new model that's been made, and it goes through another change as much as you can make, cut away again. What we wanted to do here was do something without cutting away, to show changes and shapes that you've never seen before. Transform me? I can't do it. I'm just not a sorcerer. This was a magical transformation, and, and Willow was doing it. So you wanted it to be something really special. You wanted to sort of stop everything and just look at it, you know, for a while, because it was supposed to be a real visual, you know, representation of magic. When we had to approach this transformation scene in Willow, uh, where, where Willow finally becomes a sorcerer and transforms Roselle through all these various incarnations, you know, I assumed it was going to be sort of your basic clunky, some dissolves, uh, maybe something we could do with a couple of puppets, uh, cutaways to Willow, and, and I think George did too. But Dennis Murin, kept coming in and saying, you know, to, to George and I, I think there's a thing we can do with computers now, and it might be time to really try to experiment with it. And I don't know whether it's going to work or not, but I can't really articulate it, but you wouldn't need to have so many cutaways. Well, that simply sounded better to me, <laughs> but I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, I think we can merge them. And I said, well, you mean like a dissolve? He said, well, no, it won't be dissolved, because the dissolve is, is transparent. You can see what that is. It'll be, you know, uh, a real blending. 
you know, the term morph hadn't, hadn't uh, occurred yet. I remember we had a meeting uh, sometime in the late summer of 1987. It was Dennis Murin and pretty much the entire computer graphics department of ILM at the time, which was five or six people. Here are the storyboards for what we have to do. How are we going to do that? We all looked at Dennis and goes, I don't know. Since I was the programmer on the team, I got assigned to figure out how to do the changing of the shapes of the photographed objects so that we could then blend from one into the other. History's a little vague on who actually came up with the term morphing. Dennis Muren may have used that phrase when we were discussing what the program had to do. The term morphing may have been coined by Doug, Doug Smythe, and we, we spelled it M-O-R-F. Do we want to call it with an F because that's how it's spelled, or do we want to call it with a PH so we don't look like we can't spell? But everybody since has been spelling it M-O-R-P-H. They didn't really give me any specific instructions for what to do other than this is what the storyboard says has to happen, and this is what we're going to be shooting, you know, these puppets doing these different actions. And you figure out how to make it work in between. I started working on the morphing software, I guess it was like September or so of 87, September, October, somewhere around there. And the first version that actually worked was sometime middle of December or so of 87, when we continued on production of shots until March or so of 88. Just to get those images in there was a lot of work because we had to build models that were, uh, you know, controllable, that we could, you know, just stretch the neck from one character into another. That was all done by our model shop. This is the first shot where the goat raises up in the air and there was a mechanism inside the neck to be able to stretch the neck. This has got no computer work on it. This is the way the actual puppet worked. And there's about six or eight puppeteers working this, pulling the neck up. It was like a giant slinky that could stretch. There was no other way to do it in those days, except with puppets, because the real animals, you could never quite get to do it. But I suppose if you were doing it now, you could do it all CG. We had to get the tiger here. I was trying to get one of the t white uh, tigers from Siegfried and Roy, but there was no way we could get it out here to California to do it, so we got a local tiger instead. You know, we had to get a nice take of that, we had to get a nice take of the woman that sort of matched up with the tiger's motion. And that was the trick behind it all, was that, that on both sides of, of the morph, the actions were sort of duplicated by the characters. And then the morph had then less work to do in transforming the one to the other. This is the very first test we did to sort of prove the system, to try out our input scanner, our output device, our computer, uh, transformation software and it, uh, it was real successful to us. We were real happy with it and it, it proved that if we could do it in one frame we could certainly do it in a lot of frames. I think we estimated it's probably roughly around a hundred million calculations for one frame and then when you multiply that by the 24 frames per second that movies run at, you're talking about a couple billion calculations for each second of final footage. For the frames during which the transformation was occurring we um, imagine superimposing a grid on every frame. This um, grid of points would allow us to establish a correspondence between any two corresponding frames in the before and after sequence and from one frame to the next. And by carefully adjusting the locations of each point on the images, we're able to tell the computer how we wanted to spatially deform each image. So having computed those two sequences of warped images, we can then mix the two, starting at the beginning of the sequence, mostly uh, mixing mostly ostrich with a very faint amount of turtle, and then proceeding through the sequence, decreasing the amount of ostrich image and increasing the amount of turtle, such that you get a, what looks to be a transformation of the image. And here's an example of another sequence as we delivered it to optical. This is a transformation from the tiger to Rizal's actual form. One of the things that's really satisfying about this kind of project is that it uh, demonstrates how computer graphics can be integrated with more traditional special effects techniques in the uh, production of feature motion pictures. Once the negative of the computer graphics arrived here, we treated it like any other piece of film. We made all our intermediate elements on color film and high contrast black and white, and then ran it through a printer much like this one behind me, just to 
blend the background and the foreground of the transformation together so it looked as if it was shot all at one time. The tiger and the tiger's mat pass are shot every other frame. So we loaded up in the printer and set the printer to print one and then skip the other. So we would first photograph the color, then skip over one to the next color frame and the next one. We rewind and use, using some of the same negative, we'd shoot the mat pass, one, skip to one, skip to one. This allows us to derive the mats that we need and the color in order to blend the two of them together into the background. He does not need to know everything. I didn't tell him everything. You told him enough. My reaction to it when we saw it was, you know, did we do that? I mean, how is that possible? I'd never seen anything like it. Dennis's first exact reactions, I think they were somewhere along the lines of first, wow, that's really neat, and then second, can you make it do this? This was probably the first time the real world objects were manipulated in the computer and then gone back under film. <laughs> Nothing like this had ever really been tried that I know of. It had been tried, you know, in the uh, academia world for research, but not necessarily in to actually for a motion picture. But because we're set up to do movies here, we had the people and the willpower and the know-how to, to say, let's try to solve this problem. And we put all the attention to it. It was really fun and exciting to be part of a, of a breakthrough. I wish I could say it was my brainchild, outside of saying, geez, it's a shame we have to cut away a bunch of times uh, and do those hokey dissolves. That's, uh, that's, that's about all of the authorship that I can claim on that. Dennis was really, a, you know, provided the vision. There were these promises the computer graphics were making that were not delivering. And it, it just, we just had to force the issue if we were going to get it to actually happen. And by sort of pushing this cheapo blue screen through the film formula uh, and seeing its shortcomings, but how fast it was to shoot it, it seemed like, boy, we've got to get it going, you know, somehow so we can really shoot it that fast and get it in the movie, but looking better and easier to do, easier to get that way. And one of the ways would be digital. So I've all the time been sort of pushing for this stuff to work because the old effects that we were doing up till then, we sort of hit a brick wall. For me, Willow was a unique film because it had a number of wonderful things we could do with it. You know, we but great opportunities to do effects in Willow. There were all sorts of different types. It was also very frustrating that we couldn't quite get into the digital and computer graphic world yet. So here's it, all this work, and if we just could get this working, it could be that much neater and that much better, but we'll do the best we can right now with what we got. And we ended up with morphing, and we ended up with a few things that, that were sort of showing the future. So you've got both types of work in the film. You've got, the, you've got the best that could be done in the late 1980s, and you've got a preview of what's coming in the 90s. I did continue working on morph a little bit after Willow was done. The next version of the software had to handle a few things that were unique to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. There was a scene near the end that we call Donovan's Destruction, which is where the, the bad guy ages 800 years uh, right before your eyes. And that was sort of similar to Willow in that there were a number of puppets that were choreographed to go through the same kind of rough motions. And then I would use the morph to transition from the younger head to the medium old head to the skeleton, creepy, dusty, falling down head. To me, the film that really broke through and delivered on the promise was The Abyss. We had 16 shots, but we actually delivered them on time and on budget, which means you could budget it. Sweet Christ almighty. I think it likes you. And you could actually get it delivered to the movie and when you said you were going to get it to. That was a breakthrough. But then Terminator 2 was the big one. I, I proposed the character to him. I told him the sorts of things that I wanted to do, and he said, we can't do that right now but I think we can get there. And I said, what, that's based on what, tests, software that you're writing? He said, no, just, it's just a guess, but I think we can get there. I think that's the great moment um, in, in the course of any visual effects project where you take that kind of leap of faith that you have a good enough team that allow you to project the trajectory of your, of your technology to the, next, to the next level. T2 showed that the future is unlimited. You know, but we were the only ones that, do it, that knew it, you know, because we, we knew how we had done it and what we did. Nobody else had a clue of what was going on. Get out. Because that had all digital compositing also, not just rendering, but composite. That was a big film that, that just changed everything around. 
Morphine was like talked about like, uh, oh wow, it's really neat. That's amazing. You know, how do you guys do that? And then you didn't see it for a while. And then it was really a couple of years later, two or three years later, there were some more shows that came out that just spread the word out about morphine, and then everybody wanted morphine. Morphine, it, if you wanted to do it now, you could buy all the gear off the shelf for your Mac or your PC, and uh, you could pretty much do it. You know, it's not quite as complicated uh, to use as what we had, certainly, but also can't do quite as much, I don't think, now as we could even do. Uh, some areas it's faster, some areas it's not the same uh, as what we had, but you know, to be able to buy it for like $95 or whatever it is, and morph to your heart's content is pretty neat. It oversaturated the market, and then everybody stopped using it and started talking about, well, we'd like an effect kind of like morphing, but not morphing. So there was this backlash quality to it, which uh, was interesting as well. Most effects, you know, if they're really memorable, you start getting tired of them pretty quick because everybody copies them. There's examples all over the place of that happening. That's why we always have to be a step ahead of uh, the public. And that's why it's so hard doing this work, too, because you've got, when you're trying to be on the edge, you've got nowhere to look to find out what hasn't been done. They are so creative that when you, when you start kicking ideas around with these folks, it's exhilarating, and you come away not feeling burdened. Instead, you know, sort of thrilled by what is possible. For me, Willow was a unique film because it, it sort of represented very much the end of photochemical era of filmmaking and, and the beginning and the promise of the beginning of digital. Since doing Willow, you've seen computer graphics in a lot of other films. So we followed it up with The Abyss, Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, Death Becomes Your Jumanji, and a lot of other ones, Forrest Gump, many, many more. And since then, there's been hundreds of films that have used CG. The nice thing about Willow is that the work is very, very appropriate to the film. The morphing sequence fit right into it without upstaging it, without trying to be too showy or anything like that. It's just a simple example of magic that would have been used at that time, and it's played that exact way. It fit perfectly into the movie.